Hey, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's been a while since I've been at this podium, but uh, I have been here before, and uh, thanks to everybody for organizing this and having us back. I wanted to take an opportunity to talk a little bit about GPS, and of course, on your own topic, you feel like everybody knows everything because you've given the talk a thousand times. And I have to remind myself, I was talking to Ilka last night at, uh, at the bar and realizing he knew some about my presentation, and he also represented the fact there's probably other people here that don't know all, all the gory details about accessible GPS. So I'll start with a, a thumbnail about that. We currently have GPS on various PDAs, including this small one that I'm reading my notes from here called the BrailleSense on hand. And the BrailleNote and BrailleSense products really represent the specialized devices with speech and Braille output that Sendero has developed around for quite a few years, actually starting on the laptop in 2000, and then the Braille Note products in 2001, and then we had on a Windows mobile device for a number of years, uh, which is Windows Mobile 6 has been discontinued, so that's no longer around, and of course is being replaced by uh, the iPhone and, and other mobile devices. But the GPS, we've focused on making that accessible, which without giving you a, an extensive demo or showing you a video, really means that accessible GPS is way more verbose than your average sighted person's GPS, number one. And number two, it provides a lot of what we call look around information. So as a blind person's walking along, I want to know what street am I coming up to and crossing, what are the businesses I'm passing. That's look around information. We need a lot more prompting and coaching um, on average than the sighted person because they obviously have their eyeballs to look around and pick up this information with on their own. So that's been the focus of our interface for any number of years. What I wanted to talk about a little bit is the iPhone implementation of this and its pros and cons. And then a little bit about uh, moving identif and identifying moving objects, mainly people. In terms of uh, the iPhone, I'll, I'll give you a quick demo of what you'd hear if I just launched the app at this location. Voice over on. Seeing our GPS. <clears throat> That's our audio logo. Seeing our GPS. Look around one. Off button. A firing position. Please wait. Facing north. Near. 2344 Fillmore Street, San Francisco, California, 94115. Location accuracy, within 197 feet. Altitude, 218 feet. Near, food, Retisha. Yeah, that's just the general where am I information. And then it has all the other capabilities of creating routes and pulling up points of interest and doing searches and, and uh, having routes be either pedestrian or vehicular or multimodal, uh, all of these sorts of uh, features. What's, what's interesting about this kind of approach is the, the interface, of course. Now it's going to keep blabbering at me, so I'm going to turn voiceover off. With the interface being a touch interface, what we really want to do is minimize how much interaction you have to have with the phone because it's it's awfully hard when you're walking to reach out and uh, select things and pick a destination or an address or whatever. On a braille keyboard like the one I have in front of me, uh, that's not so much of an issue. I'm going to try moving this handset a little bit. So um, we've done as much as we can to figure out what does the user want to hear and anticipate that. If they're not moving, then they probably want to know what the intersection is that they're uh, up to. If they are moving, then they want to know where the next turn is. And so guessing what those things are is a big part of the uh, user design that's gone into the iPhone application. There are some interesting points I wanted to touch on uh, relative to what's changed over the course of 13 years of GPS and what stays the same. Uh, some of the things that remain the same are that blind folks still need location information. Uh, the PDA, like the one I just showed you, is really the best and most productive for getting that information. 
and delivering it and interacting with it. It also is the most cost prohibitive. The uh, use of GPS is uh, still, I'm guessing, roughly among active users of technology, 10 to 20 percent of blind people have some sort of GPS they're using. And I say using, some people might buy an app and not use it. That's still pretty low and it's been that way for a long time for a number of reasons. Part of it has been the cost in the past. Um, Rehab is still reluctant to purchase GPS and to justify it as a, a work-related justification. O&M instructors are still mostly uh, not incorporating GPS into their daily training and working with, with blind people. And this mystifies me a bit because all of the universities that train instructors have gotten better uh, in talking about this technology, but. Uh, I don't find that it's, it's really finding its way into the day-to-day -day use of blind people. Uh, what's different now? Um, certainly the public awareness and perception of GPS has grown a lot. I used to ask the question, who in the room uses GPS, and I'd get one or two, and now I ask it and everybody at least has it or occasionally uses it. The options for accessible GPS have increased uh, quite a bit over the course of 13 years. You have seven or eight different platforms. You have some standalone GPS accessible units. A uh, lot of people getting into the act in terms of uh, mobile applications. Uh, data is better and, and increasing in, in quantity and quality. There's more transit data, user generated content. Um, all of this is really changed and is beneficial to both sighted and blind users. The iPhone uh, mobile platforms uh, have sort of a good news, bad news aspect to them. The high volume, low cost business model does not facilitate accessibility development. And this is something we need to think about carefully for all of us as we consider whatever projects we're working on. 90% of applications, uh, whether it's in the marketplace or the iPhone, don't make money. 10% do. And this is kind of a scary statistic for those of us who are on the uh, for business profit side and trying to uh, develop a product and make it work financially. This is not a good thing. And then you add the accessibility component to it. Uh, blind people are not willing to pay more than uh, for an accessibility product or not much more than they are for the rest of their iPhone apps, which are 99 cents, maybe 14.99. An expensive one would be 59. It would be unheard of to spend 500 or 1,000 or 1,500, which is what they would pay for other kinds of GPS products. So how do we work within this business model that's set up for the iPhone and people are not going to be flexible? The other thing, talking about uh, position statements, uh, reflecting back to Nick, um, blind people learn to compromise. I mean, this is part of how we deal with the world that's not always um, that accessible to us. So we find workarounds. The bad news is once we find these workarounds, we're not always um, the first adopters or willing to change when something new and beneficial comes along. A perfect example is the talking ATM. Those things came out and Bank of America spent millions after they got sued putting them in. And then the user studies showed that they were very, very infrequently being used. I don't know if that's true today, but what had happened is, of course, blind people had figured out how to use an ATM with a friend or family or just going into the bank. So once this wonderful technology came along, they just wasn't in their day-to-day -day operation to use it. I point that out because not only is it the usability kinds of things that Nick was talking about and others, but you also have to think about the psychology of how people approach these things. In the case of GPS, a lot of blind people just say, look, I, I have my ways of getting around from home to work. It's not worth the hassle or the expense to learn this other complicated system, and there is a learning curve. So I think about that a lot as I brainstorm new cool products is, uh, are people going to use it? And we find certain things where they don't, like the, the talking ATM, and then you look at something like the iPhone and you think, 
Now, why are so many blind people using that iPhone? It is a pain in the ass. The touch screen interface is hard for people to learn, but they're using it, they're adopting it rapidly, and it's for a host of other reasons, because they get to play in the sandbox along with their friends and family and learn all these, use all these other cool apps. In terms of using it as a phone, I don't think most of us would have switched over to the iPhone. I mean, the, the old talks on the Nokias were just fine as far as a phone, but now we have all this other amazing stuff available on the iPhone. Taking that thinking into the world of moving objects, I want to bring up one of my favorite topics that I've been pitching for many years, which is somebody to come up with a people finding, people identification application. And what frustrated me about this topic is that I think there's a strong need and there's been technology to address it, but nobody's done it for one reason or another. We submitted four or five people finding proposals and got turned down and often the comment from the reviewers was, blind people don't really need this. And I, I really felt that that wasn't true. It's just that we've gotten used to doing things another way. When I come to an event like this, I look at the list of participants so I kind of know who's here. That breaks down the field a little bit. Uh, I use my hearing. Uh, this isn't a particularly noisy environment, so it's pretty easy to navigate if I'm in a, a, a social cocktail situation. There's other techniques. I stand by the bar because people are going to come there. I got you. So um, what, what are we going to do about that? Um, the best solution I've found technically, and there's things like face recognition that would be great long term, but right now everybody's emitting a Bluetooth signal. If your phone is on, your PDA is on, there's a Bluetooth signal out there. If your ID is associated with that, then I technically could know who's in this room if they've chosen to make that information visible. So we finally, after these rejections, got an SBIR, created a people finder app, which simply scans for other Bluetooth signals that are also using the people finder app, and phone comes on and triggers and says, Peter Condesani is in the room. And by the way, Peter and I have been messing with this for years. There was a version on Nokia six, eight years ago that did this. So it's, it's nothing new, Nobody's, it just hadn't been implemented. And I emailed folks about this, and the only person I got to play this game with me was Gordon. Thank you, Gordon. <laughs> we met last night in the, in the small hotel lobby where we would have found each other anyway, so it didn't really matter. But it's the concept that I want to promote, and then it's the idea that eventually we need more people uh, wanting to use this sort of technology or it won't catch hold. So our real emphasis as we've made a phase two proposal is that this be used for conferences, for sighted people, because any time we get into the mainstream arena, then the product all of a sudden fits in with the iPhone business model of being low cost, high volume, and that's where we're going to find the volume of users to make it affordable and ubiquitous and therefore hopefully available to blind folks. So we'll stay tuned to September to see if we get that funding, and if we can, I think we've got a real viable option that maybe some of you, next time we meet, will just have running in the background and not have to think about it, and uh, we'll have an accessible way of finding each other. So I'll end there and see if there's any questions. Question over there from Ali. I yeah. be ready. And I was reminded, so please, if you don't mind, when you ask a question, and I hope you guys notice the microphones are working, give me too much. Uh, can you say also your name or your institution? Sure. Ali Pelli at the Scape Inside Research Institute in Boston. Uh, just a, a suggestion for uh, the market in the, in the conference is great, but if you could add something for those of us who have perfectly good vision the terrible memory for faces or names with the faces. So if you could combine that with bringing up the picture in the name um, uh, in writing, that, that will be very useful and will expand your market uh, substantially. No, ab absolutely, and that's what we're, we're planning to do. We've, we've teamed up with a company called SpotMe. And has anybody here ever gone to a conference with a SpotMe device? 
they used to be on a dedicated device. They're now on the iPad and the iPhone. And all of your conference materials are contained in the app, as well as uh, schedule changes, real-time connection on Wi-Fi. The only thing they're missing right now is people finding. And we've discussed this very aspect of, of why sighted people would want to have this. Recognizing faces is one of those things. Anybody else? Uh, John? Yes, uh, Mike, that was great. Can you say a little more about, um, in the people-finding application, how you would sort, say if you enter a room somewhere and there's you know, 14 people, uh, and how do you sort through the information? That you, how do you present the information? How, do you, how does the user sort through it? John, that's a good question. So far, we haven't had 14 people pop up on it. <laughs> Uh, this is why we, we really need to get into uh, hooking up with SpotMe where they have thousands of users to find out technically is there going to be some kind of clash with all of these signals coming in. How do you sort? Do you give people priorities? There's a lot of social applications that are already dealing with uh, prioritizing, selecting from friends and family and colleagues. So I think we'll have to, to establish some hierarchy much in the same way that they've been used. And this would be used, by the way, in conjunction with Foursquare, Facebook, and others, so that those applications would identify that, hey, Jim Marston's in the vicinity. I don't know if he's on this floor or outside or whatever, but his, his Foursquare is running and says he's nearby. Let's then uh, have the People Finder app deal with the final frustrating 50 feet. OK, I'm going to have Vernon. Um then I think that Nick has a question, and then I think we need to stop here. I didn't see your name. Uh, this is uh, Vernon Odom. I'm at West Virginia University and on sabbatical here at <coughs> Smith Kettlewell for a while. So the, the real question I had was, it sounds great, but for example, I've turned my phone off because I don't want anyone to call me in the middle and disrupt the, the meeting. So it would strike me that there are a lot of folks who do that at conferences, especially uh, when there's a speaker. So uh, how would that interfere or... or uh, Did you turn your phone on during the break? No, I didn't, but uh, I could have. <laughs> that's, that's I really plan good. on turning it on during lunch. <laughs> you know, it's, it's important that uh, people have all the privacy concerns and the, the, the you know, vibral uh, way of knowing that somebody's nearby. There's a lot of different mechanisms. You may or may not want to be found, and that needs to remain a choice of the user, but there's also some behavioral aspects to it where you have to learn to have it on if you're going to participate in you being found or you finding somebody else. Just quickly, uh, this is Debbie Gilden. I work here at Smith Kettlewell. My little Panasonic Lumix camera has face recognition, including something called memory. It says, Register face images with information such as names and birthdays. Now it's not maybe quite as flexible as Bluetooth, but you know, who knows? Maybe there's some technology there that is worth looking into. There's a lot of people looking into that um, currently, and you can get some. Um, there's there's some free APIs for face recognition, and we will do some testing with that. The folks from IQ Engines uh, are part of our proposal. We don't see that that's a solution because of lighting. Uh, issues and many other aspects of face recognition where it's not ready for prime time, but it does present uh, maybe in a limited situation uh, with a limited number of people, uh, something like this, maybe some face recognition could be useful. Mike, I'd love to, uh, th Nick Judici, I'd love if this could include voice recognition. So, uh, as, as part of this, because I, I submitted an SBAR but the reviewers also told me that it would blind people wouldn't use it, and they're all good at voice recognition. Well, I, I wouldn't yeah. know my mother if she showed up. I'm terrible <laughs> at it. And, uh, you know, no, no, I have told her. She tested me on this, and I didn't know who she was. But I mean, it would be it would be interesting if that could be incorporated in this, so that because the person would be close, but you would do a, a kind of a template matching. Good idea. I had, had not considered adding that. So, one more twist. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks very much. <laughs>